Okay, so in part two of the content today, I'm going to talk about some, um, the, like, what I'm going to call classification struggles. And again, this relates to Bourdieu's work about how people relate to each other, um, you know, through, in different kind of social circumstances, through things like tastes and morals and values. So, um, I'll begin with by kind of doing a little bit of description and showing some examples of, um, from the media about, um, that, that invoke the figures of Hibson and Boga, then kind of make some kind of sociological points about those things. So throughout this part of the, um, of the talk, there's, um, in the lecture note PowerPoints, there's links to various stuff that you'll be able to click on and have a look at, um, the examples themselves. Some of them are YouTube videos. I hope all the links still work. Um, just let me know if they don't, um, but yeah, and there's a, other kind of quotes and stuff that I'll, I'll use as well throughout. So the two areas that I kind of did case studies about for um, this project was um, on news and comment pieces and then also parody, satire and um, comedy pieces. And so I'll start with the kind of the news and comment stuff, so there's some examples there. Um, so there's a, the, what was I found really interesting was the comments about the kind of new forms of sexism and racism that were associated with the hipster, this kind of ironic joke telling, I'm so woke that I can't possibly racist or sexist kind of figure where they'll kind of then, you know, do those kind of things to be edgy. Um, so there's a kind of, uh, there was a growing analysis of that. Um, there was particular some political analysis that talked about the hipster as a kind of post-subcultural figure that um, has no resistance in their body at all and just as kind of the dead end of Western civilization and is just kind of, you know, blindly consuming a historical, all these kind of things. Um, other kind of more deeply class analysis started to look at the fact that things like the indie music scene um, is particularly now dominated by um, the middle class and really the upper middle class because the music scene in particular is harder and harder to make a living out and so the argument is the only people can afford to do it are the ones with relatively pr privilege that have a lot of parental or family support, have the right connections to industry, have the kind of luxury of being able to kind of take gap years and stuff like that to develop those things. Um, but, you know, very broadly though, a lot of the kind of comments about hipsters were m more so about things like consumerism. There was, um, and particularly kind of the rise in notions of authentic consumerism, craft, um, you know, the obsessions we say, you know, organic beers or coffees or, and things like that. Um, these kind of cultural practices were often associated with the hipster. Um, even, even if the story was kind of about some kind of older, you know, white middle class person, they would kind of talk about it as a kind of hipster culture, even though the person obviously wasn't the kind of stereotypical hipster. Um, but it was particularly prevalent in anything that young people were doing in that kind of, um, you know, creative industry um, and um, consumer and hospitality industry in particular. Um, <clears throat> particularly associated again with those kind of middle class cultural signifiers that are particularly concerned with things like authenticity. Um, yeah. There was also an interesting um, amount of analysis about how maybe the hipster could save, you know, um, the world from, you know, economic decline and, you know, um, climate change and things like that because of the kind of, you know, return to more kind of art artisanal things that are made by the person, you know, at a particular location and sold to the people around them. Um, things like bakeries and, um, you know, the uh, wine and um, whiskey distilleries that tend to have a more local market in that way of thinking about it rather than the kind of, you know, things say like, you know, international corporations moving that stuff around. Um, that was often referred to as the flat white economy, um, but it's been largely debunked as a kind of way of um, solving those problems as well. So the hipster examples would tend to be really analytical of things. They weren't all that denigr denigrating or insulting to various people. They tended to be have, at a more analytical level. But when the bogans invoked, you know, there's specific examples where opinion pieces in particular would like unpack what the bogan mean and often meant and often say quite similar things that I'm saying here, but for the most part when it's invoked in media stories and in comment pieces in particular, it's used as an insult for working class people, but not even really all working class people. Um, it's used as an insult for a particular kind of working class, class people, the kind of vulgar, overt consumer, the kind of undeserving um, working class figure. <clears throat> 
so there's kind of different analysis of different types of bogans you know and there's there's always this stuff about how the bogan is apparently environmental uh, vandal which again the actual um, accounting for that is very dubious whether kind of people from the the working classes themselves have like higher um, sustainability footprints than people in the middle classes who you know tend to take a lot more plane rides and stuff like that which are about the a, a huge um, contribution to those kind of things um, so you know the idea of McMansions and widescreen televisions and all this kind of stuff that's apparently vulgar tastes the Toyota Hilux comes up a lot um, and the Commodore um, there's a kind of boganization of culture but again it's not always detached to kind of poorer people or working class people um, so you know this can be billionaire bogan in, but bogans um, and the, you know the the daughter of the boss of Formula One was described as a bogan by, a, by a, an Australian MP and all these other examples. The important distinction though that I, I want to kind of clarify here is that yeah the, the bogan tended to be more used as a kind of overt insult where the hipster was kind of more analytical and a little bit more playful. That's not to say though there wasn't a lot of playful stuff about the bogan as well and, I, and, and actually what seemed to develop over the time that I was analysing this stuff is that the bogan became a little bit more something that people would claim as, you know, I am a bogan. Um, not so much with the hipster. In terms of comedy and parodies about these figures, there's a, there's just heaps and heaps of them. Um, I've just listed a few of the more prominent ones there. Uh, the, the kind of the hipster stuff in particular around stuff white people like that developed into a really kind of um, uh, best-selling book. Um, where a guy kind of just started to kind of do this like profile things about particular stuff whether it's a television show or a consumer product and explain why white people like it and white people here is kind of code for middle class white hipsters um, and would almost write these kind of almost anthropological analysis of you know if you ever met a white person in the wild this is how you could kind of get to know them Portlandia is a good example although again the creators of that deny that there was about hipsters but like Certainly the first couple of episodes was kind of fairly unmistakably about kind of what we could consider hipster culture, I suppose. In Australia, there's Bondi hipsters. A precursor of all this into the 90s was certainly Nathan Barley's parody stuff in the, in the UK. And there's some other kind of smaller kind of things there you can look at. In terms of bogans, um, typically in Australia, someone ripped off stuff white people liked and made it kind of things bogan-like. But again, if you could kind of have a look at those things, and look at the different tone of them. They, it really is a good example of what I'm talking about in terms of the playfulness with the hipster and the overt kind of insulting when the bogan is invoked. In terms of Aussie television, things like Bogan Pride, Houseos, Kath and Kim invoke the bogan all the time in you know different ways. Sometimes a little bit celebratory, sometimes satirically, sometimes more kind of in denigrating ways. Denigrating ways. And then there's something like Upper Middle Bogan, which. In, is kind of almost a kind of parody of equal opportunity. It um, you know it takes the piss out of the upper middle class as well as it does the kind of more bogan culture as well. All these kind of hipsters and bogan parodies kind of draw upon and touch upon the same traits that I was talking about in the first half of the lecture and kind of use different consumer products, different morals and values to kind of um, draw out that comedy. Now there's a kind of whole bunch of interesting sociology and philosophy that kind of talks about what humour means and how comedy works. In the UK in particular, there's been some recent stuff um, done by Sam Friedman um, and some others that use Bourdieu that talk about how comedy tends to represent a really middle class point of view, particularly stand-up comedy, and there's a whole kind of hierarchy of who gets the gigs and who gets the kind of exposure that kind of really reinforces um, class inequalities. But more broadly, there's kind of been you know a long history of um, um, theories about what humour does and Simon Critchley in particular has got uh, some, um, a really small little book on comedy that I think is well worth looking at if you're interested in this and he points out that there's been a kind of three interlinking theories of humour there's superiority theory which is essentially your racism and sexism and that kind of stuff there's relief theory where comedy is kind of used to kind of you know release and enjoy and um, release pent up nervous energy and where we kind of you know, experience some pleasure. And there's kind of incongruity theory, which kind of, um, I suppose the humour is based on juxtaposing what we know is actually real and what actually takes place in the joke. And these things um, interact. So I suppose the, the key one I'm kind of drawing upon in this is the superiority theory, where people use the hipster and bogan to kind of, um, you know, denigrate others, or if not, just 
not to create superiority, to create, create hierarchies. Critchley points out that sometimes there is kind of resistive kind of comedy and things that kind of point out the truth and speak to power and all that kind of stuff. Um, but quite often he argues that most comedy is fairly reactionary, the comedy of recognition. <clears throat> Critchley is particularly interesting in the kind of philosophy, he's a, um, a philosopher that's interested in kind of, um, you know, our existential position in the world and kind of reactionary humour kind of he argues, tells us important truths about who we are. Um, it kind of exposes our anxieties about the world changing and, um, you know, uh, we can really kind of um, shed some light on who we think we are and who we want to be and who we'd not rather be. And this can sometimes be quite disturbing in many ways if you think about it from that sociological position of um, understanding how much of it seems to reflect, um, you know, discriminatory positions. So in terms of my own analysis here, um, I've kind of, you know, touched upon some of these things already. Um, the hipster and bogan are kind of almost quintessential figures of young people in Australia. They're kind of brought up all the time. I mean, for a while there, most of the stories in the newspapers in particular, when it was anything about cultural consumption or even anything about the labour market, tend to invoke these figures in some way or another. Um, so it's important here to note that the bogan and hipster aren't necessarily about young people. They're kind of they do break those boundaries, I suppose, to the age back brackets. But really, many of the stories tend to um, focus on young people, and they particularly tend to use images of young people, and particularly for the hipster. So the hipster tends to equate with middle class endeavours. Um, as I've said already, there tends to be a bit of a reflexive irony going on with the analysis of the hipster, um, and particularly um, the opinions of it. The term is invoked normally in a quite playful way, more often not, the Bogan was much more symbolically violent in that Borgesian sense. Um, the Bogan was kind of used as a folk devil. And I mean, there was, you know, really kind of a lot of moral panicky stuff about Bogans in the analysis, in the, in the things that I looked at. So these figures enable us to perform distinction. Um, that kind of taste classifiers and the classifi classifiers the classifier thing. But it kind of it allows us to do it without actually talking about class. Um, you know, material inequalities recede to the background and we start focusing on things like taste and consumption and morals and values. So both terms are used a lot as pejoratives towards different taste cultures. They tend to be used about people that are not like us. Um, but the hipster mostly provokes kind of discussion and debate where the bogan mostly provoked disgust and denigration. So like taste classifiers, and it classifies the classifier, these figures classifier but they also then classify the classifier as well. One person's hipster can be another person's bogan. In terms of the kind of um, location of these things, the hipster is a global figure. Um, so the hipster is a kind of thing that's invoked all over the world. Um, and not just in the kind of, you know, Europe and America and Australia, There's it's increasingly a figure that's invoked in Asia and in the Middle East. Um, but the bogan is obviously a local Australian figure. So what's interesting about that, the middle class figure is kind of this mobile figure. It's used all around the world, while the, the kind of working lower class figure is inherently local. And different countries have their own version of the bogan. And that in and of itself is an interesting form of symbolic violence, I think. So to, you know, to go a bit further with this, um, you know, can, sh can kind of the fuzziness of what's going on here, how the kind of category slide and, and that kind of thing, um, is interesting in terms of the class relations of who was doing the production of the news and commentary, commentaries and doing the production of the um, comedy and parodies. What's at stake here? Why is one more playful than the other? Well, you could easily make some kind of quite strong homologies here with, you know, who was doing the production. And in that sense, the hipster kind of cultures and the hipster things that kind of are parodied or satired or discussed tend to reflect the tastes of the ones doing those productions because they're much more middle class. Who are the people making the news and writing opinion pieces and, you know, um, making media and films and television? They tend to be people that are middle class and relatively well off. So there's a social homology going on with the people that make these things and the thing that they're talking about. So that results in more reflexivity, a little bit of irony, a bit of self-knowing, more ambivalence. In this sense, the, the hips is kind of a problem, but it's not so bad, right? They're just kind of these silly figures. The bogan tends to be someone that's not 
you know, not the class of people that uh, are making this, making news stories, writing in the newspapers, writing magazine articles, writing on um, websites, um, more prominent news kind of websites. And they're not really the ones, you know, making prominent um, comedy pieces and films and that kind of thing. And again, a Borgesian analysis can kind of get us understand who has access to the kind of education and opportunities um, to, to be able to do that in the first place. So in this sense, the Bogans are not the ones doing the talking, the hipsters are, and the Bogans are always talked about. There's a kind of social distance between the taste and lifestyles of the figure of the Bogan and the people that are kind of, you know, producing the media and the representations of them. So again, this is a kind of more straightforward example of symbolic violence. The Bogan is a more abjectified and pathologized figure that expresses kind of disgust and, and you know, downward disgust on people below you in the system. The Bogan tends to provide, provoke, rather than where the hipster provoke debates and issues about issues, the Bogan tends to provoke complaint about morals and downward envy and fairness and things like this. So in this sense, there's a kind of power happening in these kind of every time that these figures and terminologies are used. Um, in in the, they they what Beverly Skeggs calls um, labels, they make class in that sense that everyday relationality is the way that actually class is made and the way that it's used in terms of that we relate to each other and what we think about each other. Um, and therefore it's kind of very central to the way that we do our identities, um, the way that we prescribe identities onto others. So in many ways the kind of bogan in that sense is a good example of Borges', Borges idea of misrecognition um, and you know it's a way of ascribing our own anxieties onto other things. So Beverly Skeggs, I think, is particularly an interesting person to kind of read about these kind of issues. Her work was um, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s around young working class women in the UK and the various forms of symbolic violence that they were um, experiencing. And she talks about how there's a kind of whole complex kind of symbolic economy that kind of keeps people in their place, largely done through the denigrations of these kind of figures and terminologies. She calls this, she calls this processes of inscription and there's a whole bunch of exchange and values and perspectives that kind of inscribe these meanings onto the bodies of people that they therefore have very little control over. Um, in this sense, and I think this is a particularly powerful quote, the powerful not only hide their spurious claims to power through legitima legitimating their own interests, but also through access to systems of symbolic dom domination, being able to kind of make the news, be able to be the ones making the comedy, which impose fixity onto those from whom they draw and claim moral distance. Some people can use the classifications and characteristics of race, class or femininity as a resource. And I would argue that this is what the kind of many of the kind of hipster productions and comedies do, while others cannot because they are positioned as them. And I think that's what happens with the figure of the Bogan. So there's a whole bunch of kind of struggle and fuzzy boundaries going on here. And again, it's an interesting way of thinking about Bourdieu's struggle. That's kind of some people get the um, ability to make the media, to make the world in their own image in that sense. The ones that kind of get to enforce the values and morals that they have on the others and then make those value judgments. So again, Skeggs argues that this is a really important way that class works. That in many ways, this kind of cultural taste, morals and values um, system uh, props up the material inequalities that um, class is also obviously um, defined of through economic relations. It's a way of legitimising those inequalities because it inherently um, blames people lower in the system to be, you know, lazy or feckless or whatever. So she, she argues, argues analysis of class should aim to capture the ambiguity produced through struggle and fuzzy boundaries rather than fix class in its place, to measure and know it. Class formation is therefore dynamic, produced through conflict and fought out at the level of the symbolic. Steph Lawler's work is also particularly interesting in this kind of relational um, categories where she does an analysis of particularly middle class women in the UK, what she calls the disgusted subject. And she argues that many middle class women in this sense define themselves in their relation to what they're not and much of that definitional work is done on kind of denigrating women below them in the class system. So in this sense, the Bogan in particular is a kind of abjectifying figure. It's a, something that kind of provokes disgust. It's a scapegoat for us to kind of attach 
blame for social problems, where really, um, you know, these social problems are more economically and structurally based. So the bogan in that sense is an, an objectified other. Um, and we can think about how there's like, you know, lots of those in our society, whether, you know, a few years ago it was the so-called boat person and certainly Muslims experience this othering all the time. The dole bludger has been a common one that comes up every now and then, or actually pretty constantly these days. Um, and youth, as I've argued earlier in the course itself, is sometimes used in that way. So there's definitely this kind of disgusted subject position going on when it comes to the bogan, but with the hipster there's something a little bit more complicated going on, I think. Um, and I relate this in the book to um, Sarah Ahmed's work on the promise of happiness and uh, Lauren Ballant's work on cruel optimism. So I won't go into the details of that slide too much there, but there's, I think the kind of hipster ends up kind of playing a dual role. It's a kind of, this kind of ironic clown that, you know, middle class people can reflexively laugh at. Um, a bit of a nudge, nudge, wink, wink that, you know, I'm a bit like that as well. But it also kind of points out the cruel optimism of consumer culture. Berlant, Berlant defines cruel optimism as a relation um, of cruel optimism exists when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. So my relation to that concept there is about precarity. I think um, that um, in terms of what it means to lead a good life, that idea of the promise of happiness that Ahmed writes about so beautifully um, is increasingly difficult because the world has become more precarious. There's a... Um, precariousness kind of going up the class scale where kind of you know middle class well-educated people experience precarious more and more and more as the labor market particularly becomes casualized and fleeting and um, you know short contracts there's underemployment and all that kind of stuff so many of the promises of kind of middle class existence of you know the meritocracy and you know doing well at school and making the right choices for many people now they do those kind of things and they do it well, but still come out of the end of university with a kind of good degree and then find that like all those promises of getting a full-time job and having some material security isn't actually available. So I think this is a kind of relation of cruel optimism in that sense. And the hipster in many ways is a kind of emblematic figure of that um, in the sense that the many of the activities that the hipster is kind of associated with is also bound up in many of, the, of that kind of precarity as well. So I relate this to Bourdieu's notion of illusio, and I would argue that um, in many ways, with the rise of precarity, those, the investment in you know education and that kind of stuff um, is you know maybe starting to be questioned a little bit because of that precarious nature of the labour market. So I also found that the hipster and bogan were somewhat kind of portrayed as a threat. Um, so in relation to that sense, the mobile hipster kind of relates to the new precarity of the labour market. And it, was also, it also was related quite a lot to the kind of problem of irony in pop culture and how irony seems to dominate everything, and the hipster was also seen as quite emblematic of that. So they're kind of new issues, new threats, I suppose, that have developed over the past couple of decades. The bogan was tended to be kind of associated with old threats, you know, vulgarity of consumer culture, violence. Um, and again, these figures are relational markers of a sense of one's place in social space. So they reinforce a sense of uh, place in a couple of ways. Um, you know, there's the social homologies and distances that I was talking about earlier on, but they're also generational markers as well. They mark us kind of in relation to age relations, um, and certainly in terms of fleeting notions of coolness, authenticity, and taste. And these were particularly borne out in, like, when you could see, you know, older opinion writers writing about the hipster and they're kind of the, the incredulousness of those kind of um, opinions towards the hipster and not understanding what was going on and you could see there was a kind of anxiety over kind of not being cool anymore bearing out in those things um, I also would argue that um, in terms of youth studies which is this course is about that the figure that the figures of hipster and bogan are useful to think about for you know three interconnecting ways so as I've talked about already, um, they allow the discussion in public of class to take place without actually mentioning class. So values, morals, tastes become a proxy for talking about class, but the economic side of it kind of disappears out of view. And that's obviously a really important thing to kind of hide um, as, you know, things are coming more precarious and things are becoming more unequal. 
Secondly, the figures of the Hipster and Bogan indicate the blurriness of cultural class relations and the boundaries and the blurry boundaries between these groups. So it's not always wealth that kind of um, relates to these figures. So you can see this, the blurriness here is important because it kind of, in some ways, removes wealth from the picture of class and just focuses on those symbolic um, cultural and consumption aspects. Thirdly, the, hip, the figures of the Hipster and Bogan, Bogan mimic, I think, and reproduce the traditional generational moral panic perspective that captures much of the representation of young people in the media. Um, so again, what, what I mean there is that particularly opinion pieces and news um, pieces about young people would often invoke the Hipster and Bogan and use that as a kind of folk devil narrative to talk about how, you know, young people are just too irresponsible to save up to buy a house or they're not making the right choices to get the full-time job or, or whatever. So they kind of reflect those kind of traditional moral panic relations, those generational relations where the young youth generation is always doing things wrong, back in my day was better and we made the right choices. All those kind of discourses that completely remove any, you know, um, social economic changes that have happened. And they're quite, they're quite similar in that sense as well, you know, so the, the hipsters use as kind of this, you know, this silly vapid hipster should, you know, just get a real job, save off the beard, stop being so pretentious. The bogan figure kind of is more vulgar, they just need to be more smart, smarter, they need to get rid of the mullet, they need to know their place. Um, so while they kind of invoke different problems or different relations, they were used quite similarly, similarly sometimes um, in those kind of media stories. So to conclude, um, you know, these kind of comedies in particular, as Critchley points out, can just kind of point out who a particular society is subordinating or scapegoating, scapegoating or denigrating at any particular time. I think they've been quite useful to kind of evoke the idea of struggle and the way that people um, uh, relate to each other and want to kind of make the world in their own image. And I was talking about that, obviously, the way that people produce, me produce media in particular. Um, and this is kind of a, it shows how we have affective, affective relations with these things. They make us feel things, they make us think things about others, and they make us kind of often want to just kind of hang out with people that are like us. And again, that um, creates these kind of class divisions. So in many ways, I would argue they kind of act like a kind of dog whistling proxy for our reflexive modern anxieties that I'll kind of, I'll go into some of those anxieties um, in more detail throughout the course but they tend to kind of obfuscate the real causes of social problems i.e rapid social change rapid economic um, change um, precariousness you know um, less full-time work and that kind of thing okay i'll leave it there thanks